today during our program, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. So feel free to either um, put them in the uh, Q&A and we will um, go through those uh, once Dr. Canterbury does his presentation. Um, I've put up a screen just to give you an idea of the agenda today. So um, before we get into our program, I want to turn it over to Adrian Jones to do a official welcome and a prayer to get us started today. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome everybody from Georgia, from Atlanta, from North Carolina um, to our virtual forum today, Dementia and Medications in the Time of COVID-19. Our presenter is Dr. Delon Canterbury. Um, we are so, so excited to have him and we just welcome him with open arms. Um, we are clapping for you, Dr. Canterbury, even though you can't see it, um, but I'm gonna ask everyone one to do me a favor, just bow your heads for a word of prayer before we get started. Most gracious and eternal Father, God, we give you glory for just waking us up another day. God, we thank you, Father God, for our panelists today. We thank you, Father God, for the vision that you have given Dr. Epps, Lord God. We ask, Father God, that you spread the vision, spread the word, not just in the South, not just on the East Coast, but Father God, we ask that you spread this vision worldwide. God, we thank you for those of us, those who have welcomed us on this virtual forum today. We ask that they are blessed, the caregivers are blessed, and of course, those that are coping with dementia are blessed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now we're going to turn it over to Dr. Epps for the purpose of the program. Amen. Thank you so much, Adrian, for that. And I appreciate that. Um, and that's, you know, I want to also we always open up in prayer because we want to make sure that God leads us, um, especially as we're going out. Um, this is our ministry. Um, I am an assistant professor of nursing at Emory University, and I am the leader of the Faith Village Research Lab and also leader of ALTER. So the Faith Village Research Lab, um, we formed this in 2018, right, Mia? Mia is the uh, project coordinator. And um, our goal, our mission is to make sure we improve access to resources and awareness um, with a focus on dementia in the African-American and faith community. And we're doing this through education and through research. And the ALTER program comes falls underneath that. And that's actually where we partner with churches to start them on their dementia-friendly journey. We wanna make sure we equip them with the resources, the tools that they need so they can better support their members and also the community that they serve. And so we come together and we offer these virtual educations. Hopefully we will be back in person soon and be able to travel again. But uh, we um, connect with others in the community to bring the resources. And, and again, it, our focus is in the African-American community and also with the African-American churches because we wanna make sure that we are aware. You know, my family, you know, I, I, I am really connected to this because I want to make sure that my family is aware, my fr friends are aware, what are those resources, or resources that um, are out there, and then the education to make sure that we can go through this journey and have a better quality of life as we're traveling through this dementia journey. Um, and so today um, we are bringing, we're going to do a different format. Usually we give an overview and then we turn it over to the speaker, but we have Dr. Delon Canterbury here and um, he's going to give us everything. And I'm just, I'm so excited. Um, and just a little bit background about Dr. Canterbury. He is a board certified geriatric pharmacist. I'm sorry, y'all didn't Memorize this, I have to read it from my paper, okay? <laughs> he, uh, he founded uh, Geriatrics, a telehealth-based senior care consulting company, and he helps patients who are struggling to achieve their healthcare goals and reduce their healthcare experiences. So Dr. Canterbury embodies servant leadership and places it at the forefront of his company. He's an active executive board member of the African-American Minority COVID Task Force in Durham, North Carolina, and he served as Community Health Coalition's telehealth director, helping older African-American patients 
with wellness and reassurance checkups during COVID-19. And so I think that he's going to bring us a lot of information. And please, as the questions come up, feel free to put it in the chat box, put it um, under the question and answer uh, platform, and we'll be, I think we'll have enough time. Dr. Canterbury, leave us enough time, because <laughs> I know I have some questions, and I know our attendees will have some questions as well, so we can um, engage, and I'm looking forward to this great discussion that we'll have. Um, again, thank you, Adrian, for opening us up in prayer, and Mia, just thank you for coordinating this. I want to make sure I give a shout out to Mia, because she always try to stay in the background. Sorry, <laughs> always try to stay in the background, but she is the um, project coordinator for the altar program and she helps a lot. And so we'll put, Mia, we'll put our number in there for altar and email, especially if you want to know more about how our program can partner with your church. And then for those who registered, uh, we will be following up for those that, that showed interest. And then please, if you um, if you do leave, send us a note, but we will be doing door prizes at the end as well. So thank you all for being here. I'm gonna go off camera and turn it over to you, Dr. Canterbury. Thank you so much. Hey everyone, good afternoon. And, and thank you for that lovely introduction, Veron. Uh, Dr. Epps, I appreciate that. Truly is an honor to be here and I can't wait to share uh, the ways that we can kind of maneuver our medication management while handling dementia during COVID. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my PowerPoint. Just give me one moment. Okay, beautiful. Are you all able to see this? I guess it's webinar mode, so, okay. Let's see, see the hands are raised. All right, beautiful. I'm just minimizing some stuff. Okay, beautiful. Again, uh, today we'll be discussing managing dementia and medications in the time of COVID. As a disclaimer, I do wanna state that this presentation is intended strictly for health, wellness and educational purposes. All medical decisions should be made under the supervision of your healthcare providers. Remember, this is informative and educational. So again, my name is Dr. Delon Canterbury. I am the CEO and president of Geriatrics, which is a senior care consulting company focusing on medication management. We believe that healthcare and medications should not cost so much. We are pharmacist-based and pharmacist-led, and we believe that healthcare unfortunately doesn't use pharmacists at the top of their license to truly make the impact on patients' healthcare values and health cost savings. We completely believe that there should be a health equity lens in healthcare, and our job is to maneuver this process and make life a bit easier for those caregivers out there. And so some of you may be familiar, some of you are may not noticing, but we have been featured uh, across the board in terms of the media. We've been on Spectrum, uh, ABC, NBC, WRAL, and really it's been truly an honor to see the journey on where geriatrics has taken us in the times of COVID and really in empowering and improving access to care for those affected by COVID. Uh, that being said, I've had the honor to serve on the African-American COVID task force based out here in Durham. Um, this started where two doctors at Duke noticed a huge gap in testing community resources and vaccinations for marginalized communities in Latina, Black, Black and Native American communities. This being said, it hit home to me with geriatrics because it truly struck a chord on what we stand for and what pharmacists can do in easing access to care. This journey, all mind you, uh, has started last year. And so we managed to save our patients thousands of dollars through our medication management 
deprescribing and healthcare interventions. I never thought I would be on the news, guys. I just want to just lead with this. This was something that was never in the stars for me in geriatrics, but really it's a testament to how much I believe leading by servant leadership and community service is really what makes me tick. And so it gives me joy to know that I can be here today to not only impact some of your lives, but empower you and how you can save money as well and get the best care for your loved ones who are handling dementia. So let's start with where I was before today. Uh, before geriatrics was even on the blip of my mind, I was your humble neighborhood community pharmacist. <laughs> As you may see on the far left, I am a little bit goofy sometimes. So that's my persona at work because we all know healthcare is stressful. We all know healthcare is expensive and we all know healthcare can be taxing for your loved one for you as a patient, and especially as a provider in a broken healthcare system. And so I finished up school in pharmacy school at, in 2014 and ended up staying within the Durham Raleigh area and serving as a community pharmacist. Um, I quickly became a pharmacy manager in Henderson, North Carolina, a, a rural small town uh, near the border of Virginia. And truly, as the once excited, ambitious, and, and just goofy guy coming into the workforce, I started seeing the bitter ugliness of healthcare. It got to the point where I, as a pharmacist, just felt like another cog on the wheel. I felt hopeless. I felt depressed. I felt angry. And I felt frustrated. And I want you to see these pictures because this was the Delon of the last uh, decade, okay? This was the old Delon. This was Delon who put up a face and put on a facade to make sure that other people, whether it be my team members, whether it be my patients or my boss, see that I'm quote unquote happy. I wasn't happy guys. In fact, I was angry. To let it things make things worse in the far right where you see my final position as a specialty pharmacy manager, two of the very same people in that photo were the ones who were colluding to try to fire me as a pharmacy manager. I've learned that people will still be people, but the worst part of it was how cutthroat we internally as pharmacists were, but also how flawed it was for us to just foot the bill of healthcare onto the consumer and those who don't have access to care. And so as a pharmacist, yes, I found my joy, especially in that third photo where I'm volunteering at a middle school to help teach children about over-the-counter medications. These kids otherwise aren't likely to see a black pharmacist. And so it was important to me to lead with that service and show that we can do more than just count pills at a pharmacy counter. So where was I again? And I think to sum it all up as best as I possibly could, I was truly a passenger in my own life. I'm gonna let that sit with you all for a little bit, but I seriously did not find joy in my career. I did not find joy in how broken healthcare was. And I felt too many minority older patients Caregivers, older patients, low-income patients were just left to the wayside. And I, as a pharmacist, felt powerless in a retail pharmacy setting on truly addressing those barriers to care. And so with this came anger, that very same frustration. How many of you have to go in day in, day out, hating every living moment of that day? That was where I was. And that was where I was for a strong six years of my life. And so I truly was not living in my best self. My relationships suffered. My personal wellness suffered. My own physical health suffered. And so this is not the way we should live. This is not God's plan for us. And so I sought a way to get out of this personal hell. 
So really, geriatrics is for you if you are truly frustrated as much as I was with an expensive and inefficient healthcare system. If you just feel lost managing you or your loved one's medications, then this is the right place for you. Sometimes caregivers may not know the best way on how to manage their loved one's healthcare or medications. A lot of times caregivers are just thrown into that position to now take care of them, themselves, and their family. So they need all the support that pharmacists can offer. And if you are interested or sounds familiar to you, especially if you're interested in saving more money on healthcare, then this is the place for you. So let's look at where we start with geriatrics. I founded this company understanding that medication mismanagement is literally costing you, the taxpayer, over half a trillion dollars annually on your, on your expenses. Too many times are we finding so many drug interactions, inappropriate therapies, medications that are duplicates, medications that should have been stopped years ago, and yet people are still paying expensive copays every month or three. This is problematic. And so we believe that the care starts with what the patient's goals are, and that is how healthcare should be. It should not be reactive. It should not be sick care, but it should be what are we doing to educate and empower people on addressing those barriers before they become problems. And so in doing this, one of the services geriatrics offers is genomics testing, which can help you test to figure out which medications may cause side effects for you. This is a huge tool that pharmacists can use in addressing health equity, especially in minority healthcare, where we see huge disadvantages and medical racism. I want us to leave today understanding that pharmacists are healthcare consultants that can save you thousands of dollars while taking the headache out of healthcare. I say this because the woman in the middle, that family, or one of my hallmark cases in which that sweet woman right there was found before she met us on 36 medications total, okay? I'll say that again, she was on 36 medications. I mean, I can barely handle one once a day, but here she was on 36 medications. And she was truly a victim of a healthcare system that depended on overprescribing. It's completely broken. And in so doing that, we were able to represent and get her down to eight medications. She was completely described as being a zombie, okay, by her caregiver in the middle. She did not know where she was. She was chronically constipated and she was irritable. And so this was because this poor woman was over medicated. It actually contributed to her having worsened dementia symptoms. And she will become an example of where really my passion began with this company. That being said, her family unfortunately wanted to throw her into a nursing home because they felt it was too much to manage. Luckily for us, we were able to represent this woman's patient in case and get her court case dropped in that she was able to keep her home, to keep her livelihood, to get her health care back, and was kept out of a nursing home where she was on the verge of being involuntarily committed. And this is all because of what I did with geriatrics in representing her and finding the root cause of her medication problems. And so on the far right, that was where we showed up in court on their behalf as a part of our service to get not only her cases dropped, but to save her over $150,000 of nursing home expenses. And so again, this ties into the point of where this hits home for me. Healthcare is broken, guys. This is not a secret. Providers know it, pharmacists know it, nurses know it. This is not just me. And you all know it as the patient experiencing it. In addition to those $528 billion spent on mismanaged medications across the US, nearly 275 
thousand people die because of these medication mismanagement. And unfortunately, healthcare almost added my grandmother, who was beautifully placed in the middle, as a part of that number. They tried. My parents on the far right were immigrants and they came from South America and that's me with the chubby cheeks in the middle of them. And that was actually in New York where a lot of my family immigrated to from Guyana, South America. Unfortunately, as people get older, nearly 50% of older adults are taking more medications than they actually need. And for an advanced country like the US, we are still grossly showing up last in terms of industrialized countries for healthcare. We don't have drug pricing transparency. And unfortunately, my grandma suffered because a doctor prescribed something that made her dementia worse. My grandmother did have mild cognition changes and suffered from dementia in her older ages, older age in life. While she was living in New York, she did suffer tremendously from confusion, lethargy, tiredness, and irritability. She was in a nursing home, but it got so bad that my parents had to take her out of the nursing home in New York and bring her back home with us in Georgia where I grew up. Unfortunately, a doctor had prescribed a potentially inappropriate medication and in this case, it was inappropriate, if not harmful, which completely worsened her dementia for months. My parents struggled in trying to figure out how can they best support as caregivers, but also manage a full-time job as an accountant, which was my dad, Stanley, and my mom, who's a teacher full-time in Atlanta, Georgia. This was a difficult strain, and as many of you caregivers may know or have witnessed, it is not easy to maneuver this on your own, especially when you've had to move someone completely out of their environment. My grandma, during this time in Georgia, was wandering around the house. She was wandering out of the house. She would uh, unfortunately have her worst days when the full moon was out. And she would forget who we were and be irritable towards my mom which I knew was a burden to her and honestly was a bit of a detriment to her relationship with her mother. Caregivers go through this time and time again and are thankless heroes that geriatrics prides ourselves in supporting. We know that you guys are stressed and this is our time to help best help you as a pharmacist. And so we strive to stop over prescribing before it becomes the bigger problem. We work with your provider to remove these harmful barriers that can worsen dementia. We address social barriers such as food, shelter, and prescription costs. We also empower, educate, and embolden our patients in using patient advocacy and consulting. So had a pharmacist, and actually that's what happened, my grandmother suffered for four months, but if it wasn't for a pharmacist who looked at her medications and found that she was on one that was worsening everything, she may have passed earlier than she did as a 90 year old beautiful woman. So I'm grateful for that pharmacist today. And it was a message that stuck with me and inspired me to start geriatrics so no other patients end up like my grandmother Mildred. So this segues perfectly into our topic of discussion today, which is about dementia and the various types of dementia that may present itself within the clinical sequelae. There are different reasons and different ideologies on where dementia stems from. The majority of course is when we hear most often about with Alzheimer's disease. But before we get into the different types, Let's first just discuss what dementia truly is. Dementia is basically an umbrella term that shows for a significant loss or mild loss of brain function, which leads to behavior changes and physical activity changes that impact quality of life. This may lead to disabilities or difficulty in managing tasks around the home, getting dressed, 
getting clothes or bathed, walking around, movement, etc. And this being so, there are various types of changes that may take place within the body. There are Alzheimer's, which may have been shown to be related to a certain gene in the brain. There's also vascular dementia, where this can come from having levels of high diabetes or high sugar or, or high cholesterol. And then often at times we do see a mixed dementia where some people present with a mixture of different types. There are several types and in doing so, there may be different ways on how these different types of dementia are treated. It is important to know how to distinguish although it may be difficult to do that in the clinical setting. There are neurological exams, tests, and uh, cognition exams as well to, to gauge how severe or stage the level of dementia a patient may have. So I just wanted to make sure that we had a beautiful idea of the broad ways of how dementia may present itself and how some of these different types may lead to different treatments as a pharmacist. So what are the risk factors for dementia? Uh, age is predominantly the highest one for those over 60 and 65 have presenting symptoms. We've also found that Blacks and Hispanics tend to have a higher prevalence of dementia than their white counterparts. Genes and family history also play a significant role in dictating whether people may have dementia later. We've also have studies that tell us that dementia has been found 41% to be higher in smokers, 39% higher in people with high blood pressure, and 77% higher in people with diabetes. And so managing these other chronic conditions play just as important a role as treating the dementia itself, as these can lead to the risk of having it later in life. We also don't wanna make sure we don't miss smoking or alcohol abuse. You can even get dementia from head injuries or from falls. And that's why falls can be such a scary thing as a caregiver, because apart from dementia, there may be a number of issues that can go wrong in that clinical scenario. Obesity can also be a risk factor, as well as less education or infrequent social interactions. And so there are ways, especially now with COVID, that we can try to address some of these things, whether it be virtually or in person. So what are some of the signs that we may see of dementia? Some of you may be very familiar with these and they may strike a chord with you, but the hallmark ones do come down to some memory loss there may be some difficulty in communicating, or there may be some poor or decreased judgment. They might find some changes in behavior, like misplacing things or some changes in mood, as well as withdrawal from work or things that may give them pleasure. Please note that dementia is not a normal part of aging. It does happen, and there are people who have some signs of mild changes that go well into their 90s without really having true dementia. And so it is more or less common, it's actually more common to not have dementia than to have it as you age. So it's important that you as caregivers get familiar with seeing some of these behavior changes and signs. They may lead to something that we can hopefully try to treat or at least try to manage as best as we can before things worsen. And now we'll get into the nitty gritty pharmacist part of this presentation, which I do, do so love. We're gonna talk first about antipsychotics. The majority of the medications that you will see come up will have a worsening effect in those who may have dementia or dementia-like symptoms. I wanna first start with the antipsychotics, primarily because this is what my grandmother Mildred suffered from using. She was on it for about four months before they found the culprit and was able to return back to her normal self after two to three weeks of stopping the medication. Antipsychotics are traditionally used for those who may have a history of uh, schizophrenia, bipolar affective disorder, 
or other types of mood and disorders um, with a clinical significant history. There tend to be two different generations or types of antipsychotics seen in the practice today. The old school ones you may be familiar with are Haldol or Profenazine. You don't really see the brand name Tramiflon, so I'll just call it Profenazine. But Haldol particularly is a very sedating uh, first generation antipsychotic. And basically guys, these are just meant to change some of the chemicals in your brain to help you stay more calm, okay? And now in newer practice, we are seeing uh, in the geriatric world, people using this type, the second generation antipsychotics a bit more. There's Abilify, Geodon, Risperidol, Seroquel, and Zyprexa. So uh, we were in person, I would definitely ask a show of hands, how many of you are familiar or have seen any of these medications and wondered why was my loved one on it? I will e easily tell you, this is my biggest pet peeve as a pharmacist. If I see patients who are taking this and do not have a clinical indication or requirement of having bipolar disorder or schizoaffective disorder, then I am very alarmed on what is going on, what is the goal for the patient, and how long do they plan on having them on this. The reason being is that antipsychotics have a FDA labeled black box warning indicating that people who suffer from dementia or dementia related behavior problems in older age have an increased risk of mortality. That means they have an increased risk of dying from this medication compared to those who are not on them. And so when we start getting into the nitty gritty of the science behind this, generally, this is more of a clinical judgment call. And if it's a clinical judgment call, have you had a healthy discussion with your provider or your pharmacist on whether this is truly appropriate to use? There are some rare cases where the behavior of a patient may be hard to manage, i.e. very difficult to manage, as in the patient may cause harm to themselves or to their loved ones. And in doing so, there may be some hope in using these antipsychotics. However, this is one thing that I see, and not only does it hit a personal core because my grandmother, I believe was on the geodon or zeprazidone for months, which led to her clinical decline, but the evidence just is not strong. And so this is seen so often in nursing homes, in hospice communities, in community dwelling people with dementia. I see it often and oftentimes it is inappropriate. And so this gets me on my pharmacist soapbox because it does hit home for my loved one, Mildred, but there are so many practitioners that use this without really one, discussing the risks with the caregiver, two, truly discussing other options that can manage those symptoms, and three, they may not be transparently saying this can increase the risk of stroke or this can increase the risk of death. This has an FDA black box warning, and I don't know about y'all, but that does not sound fun, right? It doesn't sound pleasant. It's usually something that is an alarm that needs to be at least discussed on the table in a medical office. So, according to the American Geriatric Society, you generally want to avoid antipsychotics for behavioral management of dementia unless non-pharmacological options have failed or are not possible and the older adult is threatening substantial harm to self or others. So this is clear as day. They looked at studies about 17 trials with thousands of people in it who were elderly suffering from dementia and taking antipsychotics. There is almost a 60% to 70% increase, and I mean a relative risk increase, of having mortality or death from taking these medications. It is as clear as mud right there, guys. The FDA says it, 
Honestly, practitioners know this risk, but they still sometimes use it just to manage the symptoms because the evidence is not clear. And so I want to leave you all today, at least if anything, think about Mildred, think about your loved one, think about those medications. When was the last time you had a thorough talk through on what they all do? Are any of those medications you may have seen on the last slide in your loved one's medication profile? Let's talk about it. If they are not having bipolar or schizophrenia, then we need to start addressing this with your doctor today. Another one that commonly gets missed in older populations is anticholinergic drugs. And so this in itself can be a presentation alone. There are so many drugs that fall under this category. And in doing so, it can kind of skew a clinical picture of what's causing what. I'm only listing a few here but there are several that span from antidepressants like amitriptyline to antimuscarinics, which are generally used for those with overactive bladder. And so oxybutynin is a very common one I generally see. Diphenhydramine or Benadryl is extremely common. I have so many patients who end up becoming more confused because they were trying to get some night's sleep and they ended up taking a, a Benadryl product or a Tylenol PM or any PM product. And it led to them becoming irritable and confused. And when you have patients that may have dementia or are suffering from it, you want to avoid anticholinergic drugs at all costs. Not to get too much into the weeds, but anticholin, and I, as, I'm sorry, acetylcholine is a chemical transmitter in the brain that helps tell your body uh, what to do. So generally it's telling you, uh, it gives signals on your body on when you should potentially urinate or use the bathroom. It just has a way of telling your body to excrete fluids. And so when you take some of these medications and generally it's not always one, it's the combination of multiple. And so the patient I mentioned earlier who was on 36 medications, the reason we won that case was because we discovered that she was suffering from anticholinergic toxicity. That toxicity led to her being completely confused. It led to her having stomach pains and stomach cramps. It led to her being severely constipated. And most significantly, it led to her being described as a walking zombie. The confusion is very real. And so anticholinergic syndromes are something that you as a caregiver want to get familiar with. Want to know how? Let's do it together. These are the systems that are affected when people suffer from anticholinergic toxicity. With patients and caregivers who may have loved ones that have dementia, they may not have the easiest way of telling you, hey, I'm constipated. Hey, I have this. And so they may show it by changes in behavior signs of showing discomfort or stress or uneasiness. You may see symptoms of having anticholinergic toxicity, of having super dry mouth or super dry skin. You may have some very blurred vision. Again, like our patient, you may have some constipation. And especially, you may have some difficulty urinating because your body is holding on into that excess fluid. This is what having too much anticholinergic drugs can do. And again, it may be hard for someone who may not be a health professional, but you can definitely get a feel for some of these side effects and symptoms to help gauge a train of thinking and looking out for symptoms that may be an issue. The patient that I had not only was on an antipsychotic, but she was also on an anticholinergic drug. And she was on about five prescriptions altogether that contributed to her having those alarming symptoms that almost cost her her life. There's another class of drugs called anti-Parkinsonian drugs that can also contribute to changes um, in dementia patients. Some that come to mind are dopamine blockers, the carbidopa, levodopa, 
benztropine, which is often used when people may have excessive drooling or excessive secretions. There's also old school uh, antidepressant medications called monooxidase inhibitors. And traditionally, those can also cause those symptoms of behavior changes. So there are different stages of dementia. Um, there are generally those that look at mild to mild, moderate, and then severe. But again, this tends to be gradual, but how soon and how frequent the stages come about are completely variable. It depends on the type of dementia you may have. It depends on your environmental factors. It depends on if you have certain social tools to help equip you during this. Not to mention, minorities tend to be underdiagnosed in this population. So that means they go on for years having some of these symptoms and they may not even have it addressed yet. It is clearly seen that there are discrepancies in race and outcomes when it comes to addressing dementia. And so what we do at geriatrics is we're able to pinpoint which meds may be causing what with specificity and give you a guideline on how to get off of them if they are causing severe changes in cognition. So we talked a little bit about this in terms of anticholinergic and a lot of these are honestly anticholinergic as well as anti-muscarinic. We're not gonna get into the weeds on that but I wanna make sure I list some drugs out there that are commonly used. Oxybutynin is a pretty known one. Tolteridone, bicyclamine, or bentol, which is used for helping your stomach with gut motility. And then Lomotil is a fairly common one for those who are suffering uh, from constipation. And so, I'm sorry, from diarrhea, excuse me. And so the incontinence for those Traditionally, these types of drugs are super easy to use. They're quick, they're efficient. However, again, at thinking like a pharmacist, sometimes when you combine these with an antipsychotic or an anticholinergic drug, the combination is what leads to the issues, which leads to changes, which can lead to dementia worsening. And so this doesn't mean that all of these are red flags. I just wanna reiterate, that it's the combination and it's the clinical picture that can change really how these drugs should be managed. Another common one that is highly debated is the use of benzodiazepines. These are the well-known ones as clonazepam, diazepam, alprazolam, or better known as Xanax, clonopin, um, Valium, et cetera. So generally in those that are irritable, especially those that may be suffering from dementia, um, people may use this inappropriately, mind you, to help patients fall asleep. Um, I, I see this so often and to date, the good news is there has not been a causal link between benzodiazepines, this class of drugs and dementia However, there is a significant risk of overdose when combined with alcohol or opioids. And when we're dealing with older patients, we have to keep in mind that they are generally more sensitive to these medication side effects, meaning that they last longer in the body. They can increase the risk of having falls. They've also been shown to worsen cognition, mobility, and driving in older adults. There is some study, there are some studies stating that there may be an increased risk of Alzheimer's. Again, nothing clearly states that it will cause it. However, there have been some associations with long-term use. I generally do not want to ever see anyone over 60 on this medication ever, period, point blank, on God, whatever you wanna say. I don't wanna see it. it. It just has so many added effects that it, it gives me pause. And so unfortunately, my patient who was on 36 medications was on one of these in combination with her anticholinergic drugs as well. 
the, the risk of falls are so strong with this, it's almost alarming that it's still being used regularly. There are other ways to handle anxiety if that's what you're trying to treat. And so if you have someone on this, I understand the sentiment that there are people that have been on it for years. That is not an excuse to medically keep someone in a state of medication that they don't need or no, no need to pay for. And so the risk of this, especially when we're referencing the beers list, which is the list of the most uh, potentially inappropriate medications in older adults, this one ranks high. And so I wanna make sure we leave today knowing that this can have some issues in terms of affecting, unfortunately, so many side effects and drug interactions when I do medication profile reviews. Opioids, again, this is a pretty hot topic one. There has been a known increase of risk in falls Again, there isn't much data saying that this can lead to or cause dementia or worsen it. But when we're talking about people that already have impairments in cognition, it may have an effect in, effect in impacting that. And so understand that there is a higher sensitivity with older patients when they take opioids chronically. This is not to play the blame game and say that opioids are all bad. Unfortunately, pain is severely underreported in older populations. And so it's becoming more acceptable to use opioids. However, this needs to be done under extreme caution, particularly in those that are already known to be a fall risk. And frankly, I'm a fan of people using it for as short term as possible, only as needed. I am a huge fan of using ointments, icy hot, physical therapy, um, liniments, just to use uh, for pain management instead of trying to add on another pill, which unfortunately our healthcare system wants. Herbals and dietary supplements. So I wanna just give a public service announcement. Unfortunately, there are no products over the counter that can cure, prevent, or really treat dementia, unless we may be talking about a vitamin deficient state, but generally do not fall for the scams. There are no clear evidence detailing dementia treatment in most of these products. Unfortunately, dietary supplements even so are not regulated by the FDA. So there are several companies that will tout that ginkgo biloba omega-3s, B vitamins, uh, what's it called? Um, I don't even remember. Uh, but there are so many, uh, turmeric, human, there are just so many that say that it will cure dementia, it will prevent, it will, it will. And they can only say that they can or may, but there is no clear evidence. And so do not fall victim to the coconut oils, to the vitamin E treatments, you would be surprised how the majority of these may have side effects or drug interactions that can cause harm. In fact, I had a patient who was on ginkgo biloba, although not for dementia purposes, but she was wondering why her blood was thinning so quickly and was having so many nosebleeds. And so we found out she was on so many herbal supplements that it led to her not only having stomach ulcers, but she also had some occasional bleeding that was uncontrolled. We found that that the combination of her ginkgo biloba with some other meds completely irritated her stomach and it led to more harm than good. And I say this to say, hey, I don't believe that all herbals are bad or all dietary supplements are bad. I want you to know as a caregiver that there are scams out there and that generally this is not a regulated market. And in doing so, they are out there for a buck. They are not out there to cure whatever they were saying they will. So keep that in mind when you have that new hot topic that pops up in your caregiver support group or your social media, whatever the case is, that tells you, hey, there's a new treatment. Um, if you see something, definitely ask your local pharmacist. Definitely ask us at geriatrics. Definitely ask your provider before taking it, before you waste your money. Um, there just isn't strong evidence out there. 
And until we get to that point, that's when I'll start saying, sure, let's give it a shot. So again, over-the-counter medications is another category that also falls with herbals and dietary supplements, but not all over-the-counters are necessarily safe. We generally here in the U.S. think that if you can buy something without a doctor's permission, then there's no way it'll cause me any harm. And so that is completely false. Uh, sleeping medications, particularly those that end in PM or sleepy time, unless it says natural, which generally means it's plant-based, you can almost assume that there may be some form of Benadryl or diphenhydramine in that product. And what that does is yes, it can put you to sleep, but if you're giving someone who has Benadryl, who has dementia, and you know, as we mentioned, that may have anticholinergic effects, it can worsen their dementia. Um, and when things are worsening dementia, we're generally worsening outcomes for that patient. And so you wanna make sure you cover your bases when you discuss buying any of these products. This also includes allergy medications, the most notorious ones. Benadryl can be used for that, but also chlorpheniramine, which is a really common old school or first generation histamine that can have the same anticholinergic effects like we discussed earlier. Um, there is some mixed evidence regarding stomach acid reducers like Zantac, um, and that is still debated. There are times where that's being taken off the beers list or put back on. Generally, the verdict still isn't really out. So if you have seen changes after a loved one started, like say, for instance, a Zantac, uh, and particularly, I'm referring to histamine blockers like Zantac, of course, ritidine, cimetidine. Uh, that's, that's something that we want to talk about because it does have similar pathways as the anticholinergic drugs. But again, this isn't completely a hard and fast rule. So one thing I also want to mention during this time of COVID and especially now are to make sure that caregivers out there are using and leveraging their pharmacy services. So many independent pharmacies and chains have now adapted to using medication delivery. And so I strongly encourage you to avoid getting any contact or exposures to COVID to look into that. Check out what apps your pharmacy may have. I truly am a, a bigger fan of you using independent pharmacies, but be sure to make sure you're asking the right questions. Are you getting 90 day refills? Are you getting all your meds synced so that you're filling them at the same time every three months? Pharmacists not only can help save you some money, but they also can find out the best coupons. If you find any high spikes in your copay, they can also get you off of meds that you don't need, which is what we do with geriatrics. I also recommend that you check out getting your genes tested. Not ph most pharmacies can do this, but this is one of our signature services as well with geriatrics. The gene testing can help to determine which medicines may be ineffective for you before you even take it. The beauty is generally Medicare and Medicaid completely pay for it. So that's something that is new. It's also really a, a leading wave that pharmacists are bringing to the forefront in terms of precision medicine. We also can help with prescription drug deprescribing. Look, it's COVID, times are tough. We know that there are ways that you can get off of meds that you don't need. And so we specialize in finding that and finding them and, and working with your doctor to get you off of them safely. I also love this segment because I feel like non-drug therapies for handling dementia should be at the forefront. I probably should have put this first, but I wanted us to talk about the drugs. So I love using non-drug strategies to manage dementia behaviors. Music therapy is a growing one right now. Aromatherapy, art therapy, behavioral therapy, memory training, physical exercise is probably the cheapest thing you could possibly do. Um, and animal-assisted therapy, all may be ways to help people with coping with dementia during these tough times. And so if you have a chance to do some wine and design or listen to a, a favorite song of a loved one, put it on. 
give it a shot. See if you find some differences in a week or two in handling those, those changes. We may be able to help control some of those, those tough times and those tough, really dark times, especially earlier on that last year as COVID was rearing its head. I also want to make sure that we are employing all of the virtual tools that you can use as a caregiver during these times. I still get patients who are just brand new to telehealth. And you'd be surprised, most insurances are paying for it now. In fact, the majority are due to COVID and they're starting to reimburse physicians for that. And so instead of you feeling that you just can't have to wait until you're seen in person, if you have an issue, address it. There's usually a flat copay or it's covered. But if you can, check out what your provider can offer online and get your questions answered immediately. I also want to make sure you guys out there are leveraging caregiver support groups. There are tons of places you can rely on, especially with your local area agency on aging office, where they have nonprofits that are just focused on making sure you're doing okay as a caregiver or your loved one is doing okay. These also fall under wellness checks. And so they have people that are dedicated to this. And this is something that we can help facilitate and research for people who just need that extra boost. Make sure you try to stay physically active as well. Engage in hobbies and activities like listening to music. And do your best not to expose your loved one to too much negative information. You guys need a break too, okay? Caregivers are angels. And most of the times they don't have the right person to vent to or just talk through their day or really just take an extra half hour to just breathe and enjoy some coffee. And so I want you to know that we have your back at Geriatrics. Try to take a break. Try to read a magazine or an article or lean on a family member to take or give you a day off. Meditation and deep breathing exercises are an amazing way to decompress and hopefully woosah those tough days. Lean on your support networks and your friends and use your family via phone or video chat. Also know that there are national support groups that have your back as well. Caregivers.org is an amazing website. Eldercare.com or .gov, excuse me, can help locate you to elder care needs and services like attorneys, elder care lawyers, of course, people that are ombudsmen or others that can help with financial planning. That's also amazing. The Alzheimer's Association, of course, has a 24 seven helpline that you can also call with many things, whether it's decision-making, crisis support, or assistance as a caregiver. Lastly, I do want to make sure that you as caregivers understand the risks of not getting vaccinated. Our loved ones who may be suffering from dementia may be in older age, and in older age uh, tend to have the highest risk of mortality and death from COVID. Currently on the market, there are three vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. All are nearly 100% effective in reducing severe hospital-related COVID outcomes, as well as 85 to 100% of reducing hospitalizations from COVID. So COVID is important to get, of course, your shot. And there are several makers out there on the market. There may even be more on the market on the horizon when it comes to Novavax in the next uh, month or two. So we are looking to potentially have five vaccines by June, July in the market, I'd imagine. This does not mean that you should neglect the other important vaccines. We are still almost near the end of flu season. So if you haven't, get it as well. For those over 50 and up, make sure you do get your shingle shot. That is a two series shot. And also be sure to get your pneumonia and tetanus shot. I completely agree with getting all the immunizations you can, but just so you know, you do wanna wait two weeks between you getting your COVID shot and your other vaccines. I also want to leave a little bit of tips for those caregivers out there who are just still trying to find ways to best support them and their loved ones. And we all have to understand that with dementia, really the behavior is their form of communication. 
They're not intentionally trying to be malicious if they're having behaviors as such, but really they're trying to express what they're feeling. So it's always good to try to get to the root cause of what may cause behavior changes. Try to figure out what type of behavior may be considered risky or hazardous or annoying, or I'm sorry, versus annoying or frustrating to you as a caregiver. It does help to seek out support from other caregivers. Please know that you're not alone. And this is why I create programs like this today to make sure that you know that you're not alone and that pharmacists have your, bot, your back. Also, try to foster an attitude of acceptance and be calm with your loved one. Also, you may know that with this new COVID outbreak, there are tons of resources that are now available to you online with new technologies. They have research now even showing that using telehealth and dementia patients can improve outcomes and alleviate caregiver burnout. And so I wanted to leave with not just a couple of references for other national organizations that you can use, but to emphasize that this picture was taken on my grandma's 90th birthday. That's my mom, my sister behind me, and my cousin Meg being uncle in the back. And my goodness, she was happy as can be. And I, I'm just, it, it just keeps me grounded in being grateful in that there was a pharmacist who stood up for my loved one, who saw the need to advocate and saw the need to intervene and fight back against a prescription that led to her decline. I am grateful that we were able to not only see her this day, but celebrate her life really for 90, but for having such an amazing family. And so this day was actually taken about a month exactly before she died. We almost all kind of came to the consensus that she held on for this day and you know, graced us with her presence after. And so she went back home and that was fine. But I am happy that my company, Geriatrics, can keep people from losing their loved ones sooner rather than later because of the medication side effect. And so here are all my references from today's slides, which you can definitely have, but I'm sure there are tons of questions. My goodness, I have seen the chat lighting up, so I am more than happy to address those. Um, but just so you know, connect with me. I want to know your problems. I want to know what medications you're struggling with. I want to know if you have any financial barriers. We can talk through that too. You can book your complimentary consultation today at geriatrics, which is G-E-R-I-A-T-R-X as an x-ray, dot as dot me to get your free consult today. Complimentary, okay? Even better, you can definitely follow us online. We have several amazing free tips for you on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram, all at Geriatrics. My website is at geriatrics.org. And as an added bonus for all of you for dealing with me for this past hour, all of you who book with us are eligible for a $500 discount for our consulting services. As long as you book by April 3rd, we'll be happy to honor that for you and your loved ones. So with all this being said, I hope this was so helpful for you all today. I had a, pla a blast and pleasure doing this and I am free to open things up so we can further discuss um, your concerns and thoughts. Oh my goodness, that was so awesome, Dr. Canterbury. And I know my mom is going to be so mad that she didn't log in. So she can get a $500 discount. That's what so I'm going to fuss at her. But um, that was really awesome. Thank you so much. I learned even as a nurse, um, and I've been a nurse over 20 years, it's just the, the way you broke it down. I learned more information that can be better help me and my family. So just thank you for that. And yes, I'm going to be quiet because I could yap, 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 because I see mm -hmm. a lot of questions and I will turn it over to Mia to make sure um, you can go handle the questions and I'll chime in when needed. Go ahead, Mia. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again for that presentation. And um, I was looking at the chat and our Q&A sessions and the questions started right away. I have our first question coming in at four 
um, for uh, 24. So we'll start there. So the question is, for the patient that you mentioned was on 36 medications, how were you able to coordinate and communicate with her primary care provider to how to minimize polypharmacy? Oh, that's a fantastic question. I love it. So it's actually a part of our geriatric signature service. We conduct medication management reviews. And in doing so, we start with the nitty gritty. What are all the meds, okay? Once we have a list of all the meds from the patient and the provider, our caregiver, we assess all the over-the-counter meds. We assess all the herbal meds and the dietary supplements. And then we assess nutrition, like how are you on water intake? Are you eating enough throughout your days? And so once we have that list compiled, we have a service where we not only conduct internal tests, like for instance, there are tests that we can uh, quantify with the drugs, for instance, for anticholinergic burden. We can also check for cognition. We can also check for you know, mood, are you depressed? We can check for several things just from asking questions. And so a lot of it and where we start is working with the caregiver and we talk through those and then we say, hey, look, what do y'all want? We're gonna get you off of whatever we can because our entire focus is cost savings, deprescribing things you don't need, and of course, optimizing your healthcare goals. And so if you're on 36 medications, we're gonna take off everything you don't need strategically and safely. And when it comes to the actual communicating with the doctor, it's amazing when you have telehealth, that's one thing. But the beauty of it is in them hiring our services, we went to the doctor's office with them, okay? We were in that office with them as a pharmacist. And that is the team-based approach that healthcare should embody. That being said, before I even went there, I had a med review. I called the pharmacies. I checked their fill history. I checked to see, are they compliant with the fill history? We also checked to see what matches based on the patient report and what the provider is saying. You got caregivers who are sometimes, oh, I don't take that. And then you have care providers or the patient who's like, I do take that. And so I got to work through that too. But once you talk through all those communication barriers, I create the plan, okay? I create the plan, I give a copy to the patient, that's you, and then I give a, a copy to the provider in clinic. And we talk through each thing step by step that day. So once I'm in there, I'm prepped, the provider is able to look at the notes and say, okay, you're not on this, you're not on this, we took you off that, okay, great. Uh, let's keep that, let's keep this. And we talk through it as a team. And so this is why I wanted to emphasize the patient-centered care because healthcare should not be reactive. It shouldn't be, here's what you gotta do. You came in, all right, boom, go. That's the answer. You gotta look at things as a team. And that is where the communication starts. And so really it wasn't as hard as you thought. It was me doing my job first. And then I came and said, hey doc, I'm here to support. I'm a consultant pharmacist. This is what we do. Here's the problem. And once they see that, they're like, okay, boom, we need this. Cause this is, this is helping our patient and making our process flows better. So Dr. Canterbury, I think one thing that might be helpful for our audience is for us to hear a tip from you as to how we should keep up with our medication. So, you know, a lot of the time people don't know what they're on. So if you could say one thing about how we can best keep track of that, is it a notebook? Is it, you know, taking the stickers off the prescription bottles? What would you say to that? You know, it, it can vary. Um, You'd be surprised, for those of you that are tech savvy, there are apps that can track all your meds for you very easily. I can't name them now, but they, there are so many apps I've recommended to patients just to use. They have built-in alarms and timers so they could remind you when to take it. I am a fan of getting your medications blister package. And so for those who may not know, it's basically having all your medications, just like the pill boxes, but it's put into like a blister foil wrap material. And basically you pop the, the container for your dose for the day. And so, especially in older care, I, I rely heavily on independent pharmacies that can provide that service because it does improve adherence and it has it listed. It tells you the time, it tells you when to take it. It even can tell you what it looks like based on color and shape, depending on the pharmacy you use. 
And so that's been shown to improve adherence, consistency, um, and that leads to better management of healthcare uh, goals. And so I'm a huge fan of using blister packages, but there are patients I have who write it all down in the journal. There's some people who are more savvy and have it all on their phone. And there's some people who just bring it all in the bag when they come see us, and that's cool too. But as long as you have a method, I highly recommend using technology to your advantage for those who, who have the means. If you don't, I'm a huge fan of pill boxes or pill trays that have the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, noon, whatever time, and just lay out all your stuff on a Sunday or whatever before your week starts. I think that's a great way to keep track of your notes too. Okay, thank you. All right, so we have a question that is um, kind of addressing what's being done in Congress to, to, to uh, address some of the issues that you brought up during today's webinar. Can you give us some insight on that if you are aware? Insight about which one now? I'm sorry. So uh, the question was, what has Congress done to address, um, I guess, some of the issues in regards to uh, medication management? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> it's a good question though. Um, the last thing that really came to mind was Trump attempting to provide some drug pricing transparency with Medicare. However, it ends up still leading to more costs for the patient down the road. So it's like, what am I telling you right now? Medication management in itself mm -hmm. is widely accepted. So let's get this first thing clear. Medication management is actually paid for by Medicare. So if you are on Medicare, generally medication management is covered by your insurance plan. The problem is healthcare doesn't really care <laughs> you know, healthcare, ironically, wants you on more meds. And so you can still call your insurance plan and say, hey, I want to get a medication management review. Let's see what happens. The odds are they may not focus on deep prescribing, like I mentioned. They are not going to offer you gene testing, look out for side effects. They have an incentive, honestly, to keep you on medication so they can get the insurance claim and get the reimbursements. And there's a bigger picture of medical deception behind that. So I don't work for pharmacies. I work for you. And that's the difference between my medication management and what someone else may do. They may have a prompt and check off a box. I'm going to ask you, are you taking your, are you taking herbal supplements? Are you taking vitamins? Are you eating certain foods? Are you drinking enough water throughout your day? Are you walking? Are you exercising? They're, they're not going to ask you that. And so that's where the problem with healthcare is it, it likes it when you're sick. It, it just makes more money when it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ugly thing to say as a provider, but it's true. And so when you're sick, you get more claims out of that patient. You get more money. There's more revenue. We don't invest in preventative services. We don't invest in public health matters, which is why we're seeing such the ugly iniquities with COVID and minority care in, minor, in marginalized communities. And so I wish Congress said something about that because pharmacists aren't even seen as pharmacists. Pharmacists can't even work at the top of their license. Your general perception of a pharmacist is someone at a pharmacy filling pills for you. And so most people today don't know that pharmacists have saved billions of dollars from our interventions, yet we don't even get paid adequately for that or even have the legal right to bill for our own services. Hmm. And so it's backwards. And that's why I've had to adapt to that model and say, look, I can't go through Medicare because they're not gonna one, pay me. Two, it's not sustainable and it's not adequate. It's, it's, it's not helping. So if I'm able to do this without Medicare reimbursement to save someone from 36 down to eight medications, keep them out of a nursing home, save them over 100K and keep their house and their assets. Medicare can't pay for that? Are you kidding me? Like, no, it, it, it's just healthcare isn't designed to do that. And so I wish it was that way, but it's, it's unfortunately still a very hot topic. There's still a little bit of, uh, what's it called? Uh, provider creep where other providers can do other duties that other people can do traditionally. So of course we may have some, some doctors lobby against that, I don't know. 
but objectively speaking, uh, it's a good question. <laughs> All right. So the next question that we have, Dr. Canterbury, is coming from a caregiver perspective. And it's a two part question. The, the first part is when do um, you know that it is appropriate to request genomic uh, testing? Uh, that's a great question. So genetic testing is, is, a, is honestly a lifelong value. And so you get a report that can tell you which medications may be good for you down the road or may not be good for you. And so if you're on one medication, you're healthy as an ox, you know, you can have it for, for educational purposes, but I'm not gonna recommend that to you. If you are someone who's been on three or four different medications and you failed them, like anxiety and depression, or if you're on certain, for instance, there's a statin, if you're on simvastatin, that's a genetic test in itself. And so if you are taking simvastatin and you're finding that you're still having a stroke, guess what? The medication isn't working. And that's where those rare little nuances come into play. And so if you were that patient, then I'd be like, yeah, you should get a genetic test. And there's certain drugs that will make me think, yes, you should get one. Now, you can get it now and say you have someone who's taken eight, 10 drugs. Um, they've got some chronic conditions. Um, you don't know what the future holds. You may, you know, just throwing things out there, you may have a cancer or uh, a, a depression and anxiety disorder that comes out of nowhere. And you'll be able to at least now have a blueprint for your lifelong you know, record. Your genes don't change. Your doctor will have it. You will have it as a patient. And now, instead of you going through the headache of choosing and failing and choosing and failing, you can have an idea of where to start. And this is something that can be beneficial for anybody. you know. And that's where I feel it can honestly save you more money down the road and more headache. All right, so we have several more questions and we're gonna to try to be good stewards of your time today. So I will move along. The, the next, the second part of her question just spoke to what form of dementia is most common in the African-American community? Would you uh, just update us on that? You can speak, because I think we can say that. I think yeah. all of us can agree mm -hmm. that it's vascular dementia. Mm -hmm. um, as it relates to, um, we have uh, in our community, we're more at risk with the cardiovascular disorders such as hypertension, um, mm -hmm. diabetes, kidney problems, um, strokes, many strokes. I almost had a stroke, however you want to call the stroke. <laughs> those are, you know, uh, those are things, you know, I've heard so many times people said, yeah, like I had a mini stroke. I had about two or three of them and they just like push it off, but they not understanding that those strokes is actually putting you at rest. You are having brain changes right then and there that probably will not be seen until eight to, or 10 to 20 years down the line. So that's why it's very important. And same thing with hypertension. Um, if we're not managing our hypertension now, we are having changes that we cannot see, but it will become evident 10 to 20 years down the line. Exactly. Thank you. All right, so if we have seen signs of depression and anxiety before or during the early stages of Alzheimer's, but a, uh, a loved one has never been on medication, would it be helpful to be prescribed a mild drug for the treatment uh, now of the before the mid to late stages of Alzheimer's? That's a great question. I, I'm more of a fan of any type of therapy first. So any type of behavioral, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, talking to someone about it, um, support groups for mental changes, that's what I would probably use first. Uh, I would also want to assess, you know, how is their exercise? Are, are they able to, you know, do 20 laps from the kitchen to the living room couch? Like, can they do that in a day? and just see if that changes mood. I also use water as an antidepressant. You'd be surprised, people be moody. And I tell people to try increasing their water intake and I've seen changes in that. And so I will do everything non-farm, especially because not all these antidepressants are necessarily safe. They can definitely help, um, but there are some increases in falls risks as well when we start talking about uh, initiating some antidepressants. 
And so I'm more likely to have you try talking with someone first, therapy, um, just stress coping skills, deep breathing exercises, even music therapy. I would try those things first before I would jump to a pill. All right, so we actually have a question that came in through the Q&A and it, it states, when taking several medications, is there a best time of day to take those medications? And um, should they be split throughout the day? What are your thoughts on that? That's, uh, that's a good question. And the reason being is everyone's different. And so <laughs> it's, it's good in that there are so many medications that work differently, right? There's some that work better in the day. There's some that work better at night. Uh, when I'm telling people in a pharmacy, just as a general consult, I stick to whatever is easiest for you to remember because that's most likely to be the chances you'll be more adherent, the more you remember it, the more you take it, better management. And so there are some medications, this is something that will honestly just vary. There are some medications that you can take at night or that are meant to be taken at night. There are some that you can take through the day. There's some that doesn't really matter. And in fact, a lot of them you don't, don't really matter. But uh, for instance, paroxetine, right? That's a really common antidepressant. And so because it has such a short way of working in the body, that's one that generally people have take in the morning so that at least your day is cool. When you go to sleep, you don't really notice the effects. But we're talking about another antidepressant like fluoxetine. You can take it at night, you can take it in the day. And another layer to that question is some drugs have different side effects. You may be tired with fluoxetine or you may be amped up. And so depending on how your body responds, you may wanna take it in the morning and day if you're amped up and if you're tired, you take it at night. And so everyone responds differently. So that's a mixed bag question, um, but it definitely helps to have a gene testing report to tell you which ones to just avoid straight up before mm. you make that call. Wow, okay. All right, so our next question is, what are your medication recommendations for treatment uh, for Alzheimer's patients that um, non-pharmacological methods do not work uh, to manage acute states of anxiety? Okay, that's a good one. Um, so that is gonna still vary on the other meds. So I'm gonna wanna talk through what does the patient wanna do? If they wanna get better, do they want a pill? Do they wanna consider medicine? If that's the case, then let's talk through that. And then doing so, let's talk through the risks, okay? So we have to still start and have that conversation of what does the patient want? So you can start with some medications out there that can help with anxiety and depression. It's completely fine. Um, we, uh, so we've tried non-farm. I guess the question is, it sounds like they will take medicine at this point to me. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, this is where one, a gene testing report can help decide. For instance, there are those who can really break down some of those antidepressants and there are those who really can't. And so when you have that report, it can help you choose. Um, and it's honestly useful for cancer, pain management, it's used for all types of maladies. So if we want to talk about starting an antidepressant, we want to one, talk through falls risks because there are some that have significant increases of falls risks. So what I'm going to want to do is ask, hey, does the patient have a falls risk right now? Does the patient have any issues with walking? Are there any mobility issues? Just because know that, hey, this could be an added concern down the road. And then we want to talk through types of drugs. Uh, is it, what's the cause? Is it related to sleep deprivation? Are we looking for someone who's anxious and depressed because they're not getting enough sleep? Because we got to find the root core of what's wrong, right? Um, so assuming that may be the case, then we want to talk through what sleep meds are we trying that we don't necessarily need an antidepressant for, okay? So do we have stuff that can help with that as well? Um, but it's kind of a mixed bag to that one. It can kind of go you, any way <laughs> with that. So I would want to rule out the causes first. I'd want to address the patient goals and what do they want? Do they want to be on a medicine? If they're not, then we got to, <laughs> I don't know what we can do outside of non-farm, but um, 
you know, in some cases I've seen, um, you know, electronic brain stimulation be a, a wonderful therapy for those with um, resistant depression. And so that's more of a rare case, but it has good evidence. So there are things we can consider doing outside of just using meds. All right, so the next question we have um, is, are certain medications used in different stages of the disease? Mm, that's a good one. Um, at least for dementia, when you have severe, you're gonna see severe changes in behaviors and severe changes in that and just general functioning. And so you will, you may see some other drugs come on in. Like for instance, if you are having issues with incontinence in your severe stages or mobility, you're, you may start seeing some of those drugs we talked about like the anticholinergics or antimuscarinics. But in terms of the actual treatment of dementia, no, there really are no changes. Some people, you just start as early as possible to help prevent anything from worsening, but nothing is curative. Um, and really what I'm talking about in terms of later stages are just changes in managing behavior. It's not really about what's treating dementia, like, oh, well, you're in stage one, so let's use this type versus that. There's nothing like that, unfortunately. There's nothing that really makes a difference. Okay. All right, so we have a couple more questions and then we will uh, wrap up. Wait, and uh, I had sent, um, uh, I was wondering, can we just do the door prizes now? And then for those oh, sure. who can stay after 5.30, we can answer the questions. If you have time, Dr. Canterbury. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. I just want to be respectful for those who had blocked just an hour and a half that we do sure. give them an opportunity to um, be selected for a door prize. So Mia, okay. you had so, your, your- I, I have know. my winners. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so today we have um, two winners, right? We have two door prizes, correct? So the first winner we have is James Hamlin. And James, if you are still with us, what we'll need for, from you is for you to send us a message, a direct message with your mailing address and we will make sure that you receive your door prize. And then our second winner for the day is Sandra Kaiser. And All I right. have a picture of one of the books that the winners will receive is Intentional Mindfulness. So Dr. Canterbury spoke about meditation and caregivers taking care of themselves. And so this would be one of the um, books that we'll be mailing out. And congratulations to, uh, okay, James is still here and- uh, And Sandra. And Sandra, <laughs> so congratulations to you all. And then do you have a copy of the other book, Mia? I don't have it with me, but it is the, the book of Alzheimer's. So it's a great book that gives you more definitions about what we talked about today and gives you um, uh, just an overview of dementia. So you'll receive those two books um, by mail. So congratulations. And thanks for everyone that does have to log off. I do appreciate your time and um, your dedication and your support um, sticking with us on this Sunday evening, but we're going to stay on for a couple more minutes and like, let Dr. Canterbury answer the questions. Um, so, Well, I'm going to throw one in that I think is an interesting question. It's uh, what percentage of pharmacists are Black or African-American in the U.S.? If it's low, what are some strategies um, in which the profession is engaging uh, Black African-Americans to become more interested? So I think that's a, a great question for us to talk about. Yeah, sure. Um, my knowledge currently 7% are Black. Um, I think in medicine, it's, I think it's what, five? I don't, I actually don't know. I'm gonna say something wrong. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, generally, yes, seven percent black um, pharmacists, and I think they're more females than males. So I think it's like like two to four percent if we're talking about black males. Um, but in terms of strategies, that's a great question. This is an overarching issue in all of medicine. Really, is the lack of diversity and the lack, or I guess not addressing the intrinsic racism in recruiting in medicine. Even medicine is practiced with a bit of a latrix, 
uh, um, racist patriarchal lens. And so there are some programs that are geared to understanding cultural differences and that may be seen in their curriculum or how they're training their doctors or pharmacists. In terms of strategies, I don't know. I, I can definitely tell you that, you know, I was looking at a picture on my wall. I was um, 12 out of 155 pharmacists in my class at the UNC Pharmacy School, of which six were black males, six were black females, two dropped out. So that's 10, you know? So it's like, what are they doing? I don't know. Uh, I, I feel this is an ongoing issue in all healthcare. And generally, if you're talking to me, I'm not telling people to go into pharmacy, uh, just straight up. Uh, I feel like generally the field is, um, isn't in the best place. However, I do see potential in those who are leading entrepreneurial charges um, or innovating in that field. And so you have to have that mentality in addition to being a minority, in addition to being a pharmacist. And that's not impossible, okay? I'm not here to detract people from doing that. I just wanna be realistic in that this is, um, this is a tough field right now. Um, there are so many pharmacy schools. Um, there are so many uh, pharmacists who don't have jobs, um, who are unemployed, who graduated and still don't have anywhere to work. Um, so you have to weigh the reality that there is a huge surplus of pharmacists with low residencies available and low jobs. And what that means is your starting salary is grossly dwindling by the year. And so we're no longer the field of beautiful six figures everywhere you go. We don't see that. People think pharmacists are out here rich. No, sir, I'm trying to be, but um, ultimately it, it's a tough game. So if you have the mindset and this is in your heart, this is why I feel it's important to stress your passion. And if this is something that you love, um, you know, pursue, but definitely talk through that piece with someone in the game. Well, thank you for that insight. All right, so one of the other questions we have is how would a family caregiver request an assessment of current prescriptions taken by uh, the patient living with dementia? And how would your company work with the neurologist following that assessment? Oh, great. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a great question. It's exactly what I talked through earlier. We start with the medications. If you don't have an idea of what the medications are doing, then we're not gonna have the best picture. So what we do is we get a list of your meds, one. We get all your herbals, we get all your dietary stuff. And then we talk through the real stuff, the social barriers. And this is the piece that most people don't address when we're talking about consulting and medication management. What is your social stability? Are you able to have enough health literacy to take your medications the way they're written? Do you have food at home? Do you have support? Do you have transportation? Um, do you, you know, have a support group? Do you have a loved one looking out for you? And so we have to address these social determinants of health while we're doing the med rec. You have to do it all together, okay? It's not just one and all right, let's see how things go. Because if you don't have that support or the educational piece or the why, then you can't expect to have change. You just can't. And so we start with just like today, we teach our caregivers how to advocate and we teach our patients why this matters, why these medications may matter to you and how you can get off of them. And so in terms of the process with your neurologist, we conduct this very same process with all providers that are required. With my last patient, she had a neurologist, she had a primary care, um, and she had a, a cardiovascular doctor. Now the cardiovascular doctor was not much involved, but we definitely had the same conversation with the neurologist and the primary in just terms of talking through the medication action plan. And so what I do is with my clients, not only do you guys have my cell and access to me 24 seven, but I generally will get access to your provider because of the relationship built. So I've had access to providers' cell phones where I'm texting them, hey, something's up with this patient, uh, keep your eye on this for your next visit. And we worked together and talked through those barriers. There was one time I had a patient call me at 1 a.m. and he wasn't sure if he should go to the hospital or not. And so I'm able to text the doctor and mind you the next morning, get more insight on whether he should be referred. And this is something that doesn't happen, okay? You don't have pharmacists out here 
with your name in the back pocket trying to fight for you. And that's the level of care we go with, with conducting our consulting services. So how does it look? We start with the med review. We start with the social services review to pinpoint any barriers there. And once we have a plan, we then teach and talk through what we wanna do with your meds with you as a patient and a caregiver. We run through the plan with you. And once we have your permission, we then talk to every provider involved that's required for the betterment of meeting your healthcare goals. Whether it's your neurologist, uh, movement specialist, doctor, you know, nurse, whatever, we usually use the same record and convey the same information to all bodies so that you're getting the full team experience and that they can talk through plans that they want me to do or address. That sometimes they want me to focus on adherence one month. The other could be, how can we get him more food? You know, and I've been able to do that for patients, get them enrolled in food programs. All right, and just a couple more. One is um, from Jackie Thornton of Sage Navigator, and she asks, I have elders who want to consult before deciding if they will get the COVID vaccination. Um, are you accepting referrals for that service? Yeah, anytime. Um, this job has led me to so many platforms. I, I do so many church panels and webinars and town halls. As being a part of the African American COVID Task Force, you can ask anybody anything question related for COVID and send it to me, and I will be happy to address it. That will all be complimentary. It's just more of a public service. So yes, definitely. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So um, the questions are, they're continuing to roll in, but one that has been on here for a while that I want to um, have you comment on is, um, you talked about the negative effects of Tylenol PM, um, but um, someone asked, how does the regular Tylenol um, I guess, affect your body or is, are there any uh, issues with, you know, taking a regular dose of Tylenol? Um, generally, no. The, my concern is the PM. That's the key word. Um, mm -hmm. When you're using Tylenol, basically as written on the back of the uh, pill bottle or the instructions on there or for your, for your provider, uh, you're within fine dosing guidelines. I'm not as worried about those anticholinergic effects. That is when we start talking about the PM, the, the Benadryl, the diphenhydramine. That's when I get worried about that. So Tylenol alone, mm -hmm. I'm not too worried about that. I more so just use it as an example for when you go to the aisle, you see PM this, PM this, Robitussin PM. You see all types of PM stuff. The PM generally is Benadryl, and that's what I want y'all to be aware of. Right. All right. So our last question is actually from Facebook. And the question is, um, can you address uh, frontal temporal lobe dementia and casing? And is there a pharma solution to this? Pharma solution? No. But basically frontal temporal dementia um, is involving a certain part of the brain. And we're talking about, of course, the front. And then we have the temporal. So this is the side of the brain. And these are sides of the brain where embedded you have in the, I'm not gonna go to that. But the point is, <laughs> the point is, yes, there are some differences in that type of dementia um, regarding, and it affects the gait, it affects movement. So we just don't really have preferences, unfortunately, for which type of drug can do what. Again, a lot of it, and this is why it's so important that we start thinking about clinical trials, especially minorities. I'm gonna say that again, clinical trials, especially minorities, we can act when we have more involvement and more recruitment with minorities, especially who have a higher prevalence of dementia, um, just to have a better idea because the, the research is still ongoing. And as many of you on this call may know, um, it's a fight to get education and research in this field. So the more data we have, the more we can have specifics, but unfortunately I don't have a clear answer for that right now, just due to the lack of, of evidence for one or to the other. Okay. And Mia, Thanks. I think we had one more question um, from Facebook. Is there a recommendation for a brand of genetic testing? Oh, that's a good one. Um, a brand, I can't lie to you, man. There are quite a few out there. So if you're gonna get one, just make sure you're getting the best, uh, well, let's just say this. Let's just make sure you're getting a full panel. Do not do any type of single gene test. 
So whatever you're going through, and you'll be you will be surprised, but you'll find that a lot of these companies may not be FDA regulated. And that's actually okay here. We're trying to just find out what your genes are doing. You don't necessarily need a complete FDA approval. Um, but that being said, whatever you do one, make sure it's a complete gene panel, which checks all of your genes for any issues. You're just wasting your money if you're just getting a single gene panel, which just tells you what one gene is doing. You wanna know what all the genes are doing. In terms of an actual specific brand, I do not have one. I partner with the company, but frankly, there are tons out there. So prices may range. I would think about, is it completely covered by your insurance or not? So think through that piece, but in terms of which one to go to, I recommend consulting us to at least help you with that. Even if you don't wanna use this, let us at least try to research it for you because there are some out there where for instance, it's not gonna be clinical applicable. Applicable, For instance, some people might get suckered into the, the 23andMe or Ancestry.com. And those things are great for what they are doing, but it won't help you clinically. And that's what I wanna make sure there are differences in. It's not just, oh, I got my genes tested, I know where my ancestry, that's different. I'm talking about what your drugs will do when they hit your body. And that's a, a different panel. All right. Well, we want to thank you, Dr. Canterbury, for joining us today. I think one of the ultimate reasons for doing this and uh, connecting you to our audience is that there are so many questions when it comes to medications, especially surrounding dementia, and you did a wonderful job of addressing those today. So thank you so much. I want to urge people that are with us today to really, uh, in your spare time, take a look at Dr. Canterbury's website because he is definitely offering a unique and beneficial service because medications can be just complicated within itself. So we, we want to encourage you to seek his service and just look into it a bit more. The very last thing I'll say is that Dr. Epps shared a couple of uh, links to our ALTA program if you're interested in learning how to get your church connected um, and become more dementia friendly. We'd love to have a conversation with you. And she also shared some information about the Faith Village Research Lab. So please, um, again, go to those links, check us out and look for us at our next program. We are hoping to, to uh, do these more often and we'd love for you to join us next time. So with that being said, Thank you again today. And then I'll, I want to turn it back to Dr. Epps for any final words. Because I always we're... have something to say, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, thank you. We are having our nurse next workshop is for, it's a dementia friendly workshop for church leaders that would be on April the 16th. If you are interested in learning more about that and seeing if you can register, um, please send us an email at alter at gsu.edu. Um, and I just, again, thank you all. Please you receive a follow-up email tomorrow or Tuesday, and I'll have the link to this presentation along with the YouTube link to a lot of our previous virtual presentations where we had life planning, how to develop a care partner team, and brain health was also part of that. So um, please watch, share freely. Um, again, I'm, I'm, me and Dr. Canterbury, we've become good friends. And I mean, it's all about um, being able to serve others. And again, you know, I hope I can speak for you, Dr. Canterbury, but this is our ministry. Um, we've been put here, we're using our platform to be able to serve others um, and provide these resources to you. So thank you again. I'm honored you guys had me. So it really was a pleasure and it was fun today. I love talking about this. So happy to do it again. And I'm just honored to be here. So thank you all for your time. All right. Thank okay. you. And you all enjoy the rest of your Sunday evening. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.